at Northeastern. And I am absolutely delighted to be here today um, to uh, introduce this event. Um, and I really, truly am delighted to be here today. So first thing this morning, um, the very first task I had to do was spend the first hour of the day digging a foot of very heavy, wet snow out of my driveway. <laughs> Um, so I was very happy after doing that to jump on a plane and come to the, the chilly, chilly wastelands of, of uh, California um, <laughs> where I had to wait for an Uber and was sweating, waiting for an Uber in comparison oh to sweating, shoveling snow. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, it's also a pleasure for us um, to host the event on this particular day. So today, as many of you know, is International Women's Day. And to mark International Women's Day, the university has actually had three women who empower events. One in London in the very early morning, and one in Boston, which is completed. And then the finale and the icing on the cake, of course, is here in San Francisco. So we're absolutely delighted to finish off with a bang. Um, and what I'll do today is introduce you to our three panelists. Um, um, but before we do that, I actually want to point out, like, put your attention to the side here. We actually have a really interesting um, creator. So we have Bree with us, who is from Collective Next. And what uh, Bree does in Collective Next is they actually do images and creations and sketch work to capture the events that are taking place. So Bree today will actually be collecting images and putting together uh, cartoons and caricatures of what is actually done and said tonight. So please, during the event, have a look at what she's doing, but at the end of the event, go and see what she's created. Um, so tonight is a, is a really a, a, a pleasure for us to host this. Um, diversity and inclusion are true core values of Northeastern University. It's at the center of what we do and what we value as an institution. We truly believe that diversity brings resilience and brings power to the university. We know that from the great diversity that we have within our student body, within our faculty, and it's something that we spend a lot of time and energy uh, trying to improve upon. This particular series of events, the Women Who Empower events, have now been going for several years, and we've really seen this as a really powerful mechanism to share stories from distinguished speakers, people that have got very uh, different backgrounds, different pathways through life, that have been very successful in their enterprises. And we're delighted to have three women with us tonight that have definitely risen to the top of their game. So let me do the introductions. Um, our, our first person is April Zong. Um, and April is an alumnus of uh, the College of Science. Um, April has a passion for renewable energy and clean energy, and in 2007 set out and developed a new company, Silray. And Silray has uh, very impressively been named as one of the top 50 privately owned, fastest growing companies in Silicon Valley. And I have been, um, had the pleasure of actually witnessing this myself recently um, by visiting April in her workplace, and it truly is expanding. I just heard today that the, the expansion, at least the current level of expansion, is almost finished. Um, Silvery is, uh, is a company that installs um, uh, solar panels to medium to small size businesses, and this was a market niche that, uh, that uh, April actually recognized back in 2007. It was large and it was very small, there was household, there wasn't companies that were doing commercial business. And that's what uh, April has been doing, and that business is just going from strength to strength to strength. So it's a pleasure to have you here tonight. Thank you, my pleasure. Um, our second panelist is Sherry Moore. And Sherry Moore is a parent of a current student in the College of Engineering. And Sherry uh, has a very interesting background. She is a software engineer um, on the, uh, the Google Brain team. And this team is involved in uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and deep learning. And our other projects at Google include Google Fiber and Google Ad Extractor. And she specializes in modern process architectures, 
enterprise uh, architectures, firmware development, and operating system development. And of course, as many of you will know, these are subjects which are very close to the heart of our current president, uh, President Yoon. Um, you may know he just uh, published a book uh, called Robot Proof, um, Higher Education in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. Um, and that's a, a topic that is actually within the universities talked a lot about. How do we prepare our learners for the world that's coming, not just in a year or two, but in five years and 10 years? So it's a pleasure to have you here tonight. Thank you, Sanami. And our, our last panelist um, is Janine Sargent. Uh, Janine Sargent is a, an alumna of the College of Engineering and also a Board of Trustees member. And we're delighted to have her as our moderator tonight. Um, Janine is a global CEO. Um, she's an entrepreneur, an investor, and an innovator. Janine has built and scaled multi-billion uh, multi dollar businesses at the cutting edge of technology in emerging markets. Currently, she is a partner in Catalyst Ventures uh, as an investment company. And Janine is a visionary, uh, an executive with experiences really across the board from high tech, consumer, energy, digital health, cloud, mobility, communications, semiconductors. She's really done it all. So we're absolutely delighted that she's gonna be here as a moderator tonight. Um, Janine is also passionate about the Bay Area. And the Bay Area is a place that Northeastern University is really taken very seriously as a major hub for the university. As you know, you have more and more areas that the university is investing in. Um, and the Bay Area is really looked at as the sort of second home for the university now. And Janine has really taken a leading role as a Board of Trustees member in making sure that we do it correctly. Um, which we very much appreciate. But Janine is also a very proud Husky, and we are really um, delighted um, and humbled that she's chosen to be a, spend time as a Board of Trustees member and give, her, uh, give us the experience that she's gained out in the workforce. So with that, thank you very much, Janine. Thank you. And I am now delighted to hand over the evening to Janine, to April, um, and to Dean. Okay, so enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. So, welcome again from my side and happy International Women's Day. Um, I think the series, and we'll talk more over the course of the evening about uh, the Women Who Empower uh, Forum and the foundation that we have here, but I thank you for coming. And I think part of the initiative here and thought process is for us to think about how do we have different conversations and create connections. So clearly uh, at a time when the rest of the world is sort of, I think, listening now more than ever in terms of the conversation about diversity and inclusion. We have a unique opportunity to share our voices and compare notes and decide how we together, men and women of many different experience bases, can come together and make things better. So uh, around tonight's forum, I think, and with the successful women that we have here, I'd like to you know, start the conversation thinking about and give each one an opportunity to comment on their journey and how in particular their personal lives have impacted some of the professional decisions that they've made, both in terms of either through their experiences with Northeastern, but really at a time when we're thinking about how to increase our success uh, together in a, a community as we come together, what, what experiences have you had? So maybe if we can start with that conversation in terms of bringing together your personal and professional life and how it's impacted your, your professional career. Um, like kind of like career paths? So mm -hmm. And your with journey, me. a little bit about your journey and how you got to where you are today. Oh, um, yeah, it feels like a long journey <laughs> <laughs> to me. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I came to the United States after I graduated from my um, undergrad uh, from China. Uh, and at that time, my dream is, oh, I want to go to graduate school in the U.S. and study biology because my father is biologist, a biologist, and then he want me to, to follow his career path. And then uh, in early, I believe in the early 90s, uh, biology and molecular biology is very, uh, it's very hot in the market. And that, that's where you really go in. <laughs> so so I, I applied, I read a lot about Northeastern University, and I, also I have a few friends 
um, in Boston, and I want to join them as well. So, and I like Northeastern University's approach. So I applied, and I got accepted for um, as a graduate student uh, in the uh, biology department. I was so excited and came, and then. Um, but uh, it was tough for me at the beginning is uh, because my English um, education back in China at that time, they don't, uh, they don't teach you how to uh, communicate verbally. Um, I can read, I can, I, I can listen, I, I just cannot talk that much. The only two words I can say, <laughs> I remember when I landed, uh, thank you and, and goodbye. <laughs> I <feel> like, <laughs> That was terrible. <laughs> Don't tell anyone else. <laughs> Only keep in this room. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, so so I uh, it, it was a tough time, and then but I um, I enjoyed my study. I enjoyed my time in Northeastern, and then uh, my professor it's, it's really really helpful, and then my um, uh, co coworker or, or, or other students really helped out. Um, so I got it done, and I, I, I graduated. Um, it's pretty good grade. And then uh, after that, I, I work. I found a job as a researcher in uh, Boston University Medical School, um, doing um, molecular biology study in neuroscientist uh, department. So um, I, I did research for a couple of years, and then I realized. Um, so here's the career change triggered. And I realized that, um, well, I, I may not make it a, as a great scientist because I want every day I'm dealing with the test tube and in the micromillimeter scale. And so DNA, supposed to be DNA, RNA in there. I was doing the gene regulations research, but I can't see them. <laughs> They're hiding in the little tube. Uh, and then uh, so after a couple years, I feel like, oh, I mean, I, I want to do something that I can really see. I can really contribute my knowledge and experience and um, passion um, to uh, like generate a product or offering service or something. And then I talk to my friends, and then they, they say, oh, it sounds like you want to get into business. <laughs> yeah. And I say, oh, yeah, maybe. But I, I couldn't, uh, nobody want to. Nobody would have hired me if I'm a biologist. If I want to go marketing, and I don't have any educational background in marketing or any, uh, so so I, I realized, oh, the only ticket to get into the business world is to go back to business school. <laughs> so I went I went into um, uh, a BU uh, business school, and then um, applied an MBA, and then luckily I got in. So after. Couple years, I got my MBA. I said, "Hey, this wow, this is my my dream. This is what I wanted it, and uh, forget about all my my science background and and uh, experience." Uh, so I just like wow, fully concentrate on in business. And then, but later on, many years later, I realized, well, I really appreciated my science background and uh, training. Really helps uh, for, like form, formalize formalize the the thinking the way that I um, do the problem solving in business uh, is the great combination uh, between science training and business training. Um, and then, so I later on I ended up in Silicon Valley, joined a, um, a company who's doing um, energy efficiency product and the turnkey solution for, uh, for commercial uh, entities, basically for, for companies who use a lot of energy. Uh, and so they have this product uh, that when you install this product in the, uh, in the main panel, uh, they can shave off 15% of the uh, uh, energy consumption. Um, and at that time, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I see that, um, I, was, I, I think, oh, this product service is very interesting. But after a couple years, I realized it's, you can only help out 10%, 15%. Uh, the most is 20%, but I see that uh, most of my, our customers, the monthly usage is like 100,000. Uh, a lot of like food processing companies, they, they pay their bills to PG&E for million, one million per year, two million dollars per year. And our product doesn't really help that much. <laughs> yeah, and I, I thought there must be a solution uh, to help them to shave off most of the energy consumption. Um, and then I, I, I start looking at solar, and then I thought, oh, solar is probably is a, is a, 
is the best solution for those companies. <laughs> uh, and, and then, um, uh, it, because I was working in this energy sector for a couple of years, I got into the energy, and I think that I really, it's really intrigued me. Uh, that's, I realized this is what I want to do. What you wanted to do with yeah, in the future, career. in the future, in my career. Yeah. Right. And, and then I, I, got, uh, I got in more like studying solar and I, I go to the, I listen to the seminars. And so I realized that, uh, I mean, this is the solar uh, in renewable energy even is, is more interesting to me. Yeah. I, I think what's interesting right. and I can resonate with this is that the training that you get both to combine the tech, you know, the engineering or the science background with the business background gives you the tools so as you were developing your interests and passions, you pivoted. I mean, who would have thought that you would have gone from molecular biology research to right. being the CEO in Silicon Valley of a very successful energy startup, energy company? Right. I've never, yeah, I never thought about it. I ended up in solar industry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I like it. I really enjoy what I'm doing because I, I can help those businesses to to shape up their 90%, sometimes 100% their energy usage, just using the sun, the natural energy source, and without hurting our earth, without hurting our environment. I think that's, uh, that's what I, every day I go to work, that's what I, I'm excited for. Great, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you wanna tell us a little bit about Well, actually, I wanted to comment on that too. So my so I'm a, a Northeastern parent, I'm not alumni, and uh, my daughter was part of the NUN program. And one of the things she actually learned was the sustainability. She became mm -hmm. so aware coming back from one of those programs. So like now we're not allowed to use anything, you know, <laughs> right. we're not allowed to right. drink bottled water, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, I, I think probably Northeastern does uh, emphasize on, on that mindset, sustainable environment, et cetera. So, because. Kudos to you, that's awesome. Um, so for me, thank you so much again. It's such an honor for me to, to be here. Uh, my daughter is in the WE program oh, wow. uh, in Northeastern, so I'm a Northeastern parent. And maybe instead of saying, you know, like how I got here, I, sh I should talk about like how I got to be doing uh, robotics in machine learning in, yeah. in, in uh, Google. Because when I went to school, my my focus, my, my area was actually computer architecture. So I studied chip design. I used to tell people I think in cash lines. I don't know if there's any computer science uh, major people in the audience. But so I worked for Intel and, uh, and then I decided, well, you know, coming out as a grad student, I was like, I don't want, so back, way back then, you know, you have to, when you work at Intel, you have to wake up. Dave House is not, it's not yeah. here, but Dave you, you must like arrive by eight, and if you are like a minute late, your manager has to come out to fetch you. So, you know, just graduating, I was thinking, I cannot live this life, you know? <laughs> So I need to get myself out of here. So uh, at that time, so I was working on, I worked on Pentium 2, for those of you who, who are old enough. Uh, to know what Pentium 2 was. But then after that, so I decided, I said, oh, I don't want to get up and get to work at 8 in the morning. I need to find myself a job where I don't have to get up so early. <laughs> so that's how I ended up at some microsystems um, doing, uh, doing systems, doing system design. And I was there for 14 years, and really at that time I felt that was the absolute best company to work at because there was just no other company like anywhere you can do the complete, I call it the complete stack, where you do your own chips, your own board, your own systems, you write your own firmware, open boot, for those of you who know what it is, the kernel, which is the operating system, all the application software, Java, every single thing. There's just, there was no other company in the valley, in my opinion, that, that would allow you to practically learn any, every single thing that you wanted to learn. So I, I really took advantage of that. I had a great time. I did every single software stack that you can think of. I, I learned everything. Um, and then, unfortunately, uh, because of, we didn't have the best business people <laughs> in the industry, um, Sun kind of, in a sense, went out of business. We got bought. It was bought by Oracle. Um, so at that point, I decided that maybe it's time to leave. Uh, so over the years, Google has, Google always called me. Every year, their recruiter will reach out and say, hey, do you want to come work for Google? So ever since that, 
I think 2000. And I, my response was always, I don't want to work for an internet company. <laughs> <laughs> so finally in 2010, after some was acquired by Oracle, I said, ah, maybe it's time. So I went to talk to Google and I decided to join. And I, of course when I joined, I was like, my God, I should have joined them like in 2000 when they called me. Because every single thing that you know you have heard about Google, all the nice things, is so true, and it's such an honor. I'm sure, you know, I'll be uh, talking about you know how they really uh, foster this really inclusive environment at Google. They, they have done just a fantastic job. Um, so at Google, I worked on ads. So every time you Google whatever, you see the three gray boxes at the top that says ads, you know, you, know, you have me to thank. <laughs> um, so after that, I was like, wow, this is awesome. But, you know, I also don't want to be paged at like three in the morning saying we have missed 100,000 clicks or whatever, which translates to a lot of money, right? So, uh, so I was like, yeah, I kind of don't want to be paged in the middle of the night. So, and then that's, uh, that's you know, how I, I decided to work on Google Fiber. So another nice thing about Google is that whatever you're interested in, you can, you can just go apply. Say, I want to learn about this new area that I have never done before. And you can actually just do that and, and you really get to expand your horizon. So that's when, uh, how I ended up at Google Fiber actually wrote implemented protocols like when you change channels, you know how everybody knows, oh, a million viewers has tuned in for XYZ program. Yeah, because that's all in, you know, in the protocol, right? We actually capture all that information, that's how we know. So I actually get to write that protocol, which is awesome. I also get to like implement things like the Bluetooth remote, you can talk to it and say, hey, you know, okay, Google, find me, you know, Game of Thrones or whatever. So yeah, I get to learn a lot, so that was really fun. But after that, I was like, okay, I've done enough networking. You know, I really want to know what's the next big thing. Like, what do I see as the most important thing, say, in, what's the, the challenge? What's the new wave? Well, what my change the industry, change computer science as we know it, change the world as we know it. So this was in 2014, and that's when I decided I want to get into machine learning. So I'm not a real uh, machine learning scientist by training, but over the last, I've been working in that for three and a half years now, so I have learned a lot. I'm still learning every single day, um, but I'm fascinated, and uh, I was, you know, uh, tell, if you, anybody would ask me, I would say, I don't represent Google, but machine learning is the future. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's mm -hmm. how I ended up at, at uh, Google Brain working on robotics, so. And I, th I think in, in both your stories and, and as we think about the diversity, not in, only in terms of like how diversity allows us to solve problems and create better outcomes, the ability and the skills, both the combination of technology and business and the, the self-confidence it gives us. And I, I think, frankly, one of the differentiators that women can bring to some of the problems that need to be solved is this adaptability. I mean, we just heard in the last few minutes about you know, women who have changed in their career, the industries, the types of roles that they're doing, and the thirst that they have to continue to learn while we're going through that. And I think certainly for myself and, and part of you know, my journey, I actually, College of Engineering, but I started as a chemical engineer who somehow ended up doing chip design. So even before awesome. Pentium II was the alpha in the NVAX chip at Digital Equipment, I were, for anyone who actually remembers alpha. Digital Equipment as a company that probably they write chapters and books, textbooks about now is you know, how not to build a business. Um, so I was, at the same time that you were feeling thrilled about Sun, you know, Sun Microsystems, mm -hmm. I was in the, you know, the 80s at Digital Equipment, which was a preeminent computer company of its time, and in particular a chip company. But I was a chemical engineering person at a time when what now RISC microprocessors were just coming onto the scene, and they realized that as brilliant as my colleagues in electrical engineering and computer science were, there's actually a yield question about how to design and bring chips, you know, architecture together with processes and unit operations for any of those who have dealt either in chemistry or, or some of the other areas in chemical engineering. So I was one of the first two chemical engineers hired into digital equipment. 
Uh, and I was hired right in the middle of the hornet's nest of the most brilliant minds at the time, working on supercomputing, you know, working not only at technology, I was out of Northeastern, uh, but MIT and the work and all the work, Cray computers, and those of you who remember sort of the, the advent of supercomputers. And so the ability that we have, and I would actually also say, for those of us who have been exposed to the Northeastern education system, the agility with which we were trained you know, allows you to deal with and have a desire to go into these sort of diverse, challenging situations. And at least in my experiences, moving through semiconductors and, um, as Ken nicely noted, I've, I've also moved around into some different industries. You know, what I've, what I've taken with me and what I've seen is there are moments and times, and maybe robotics and machine learning is at this time, renewable energy and, and what's happening in the whole transformation of our energy infrastructure, some might argue with food and agriculture, uh, in terms of the technology to actually ensure that we have enough food on the planet to feed the population, are these transformative periods in time. And at least in my experiences, I'm gonna ask you how you think about diversity and inclusion in the work you're doing or what you're not seeing that you'd like to see. So be thinking about the answer to that question. Um, I think you have to have diversity of experience, not only in terms of whether it's gender or ethnicity, but just experiential diversity in order to get the answers to the questions. And I think that um, the ability for us to have a conversation um, with men and women of many different backgrounds and experiences is what is going to allow us to solve these pretty significant challenges that we have ahead of us. And so when I think about some of the opportunities or, or sort of things we need to see, as opposed to complaining about the barriers that we have, I, I, I am definitely a glasses half full kind of person. And I like to talk about, so if there's a problem, that's a good thing. You need an engineer, because engineers <laughs> solve problems. Um, but it's how can we use what we have around the table? How can we create, if we need to, what's not there in order to solve these problems? And I think, you know, for me, what I at least see that's beginning to change is that we're having a conversation now, not only at the national and international level around uh, in the public forum, but I actually think in these particularly technology-enabled uh, ventures of which many of the people in the room are somehow associated with science and technology, I think you know, it's essential for us to have the diversity, again, on all levels, in order for us to actually have a chance to effectively solve these problems. So I guess my question over to, to both of you is, you know, how do you see, either if you want to comment on what you've seen in the past and where you are now, and or what you think is necessary in order for us in the, in the conversation about diversity and inclusion? In terms of women? In um, terms of, in this case, in yeah, it could be women in the workplace right. or how you're solving problems maybe in your business and company and, and are there barriers and issues in your ecosystem that you're dealing with in business? Energy and sort of the old guard in the energy industry, you know, I wouldn't describe diversity as sort of a strong suit. Yes, yeah, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say energy, especially renewable energy industry, is totally white boys club. Yeah. <laughs> when I start my company uh, in the early 2007, uh, it's like I remember the first that year I went to that um, uh, in, uh, international solar power industry, uh, industry event. So that's the one of the biggest event in the United States for solar. Um, so every solar professional need to go there. So basically every year, that's you get all the new product, the new ideas, or everything. So I went there. The first time I went there, and I, I got in, I was shocked. I, I saw all the guys, um, I mean, 800 people, they're all guys, and, and tie, and, and black suit. I was like, oh, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> I was almost shaking. <laughs> and, and then like, I, I got my confidence back. I said, OK, who cares? <laughs> I'm a, I, I know what I'm doing. I'm a solar professional. I can talk their language. I, yeah, I have the knowledge. I have, I have the experience. So I just uh, push myself to get into the club, <laughs> basically. And then, and then I realized that um, because, um, yeah, like you said, the, this is a very sensitive topic that, that women in workspace, um, it's like kind of um, secondary citizen or something mm -hmm. like that. 
but, but for my experience, I, I see it differently. I think being a women professional, you, had, you have advantage. Yes, uh, especially in the pure boys club that if you're women professional, you go in there with your confidence, with your knowledge, with your experience, you know what you're talking about. They listen, they're like, you give a good impression, like big impression, people remember you because you're the only woman <laughs> to approach them. <laughs> they see guys all the time. <laughs> so the customer respect, if, uh, but the most important thing that you, you have to have a strong knowledge of what you're doing and, and uh, what you're trying to, to pitch. Okay. Yeah, and your experience and, and, um, uh, and your service and your product has to make sense. And, and you really offer something that they need. And regardless, women or men, uh, if you're, you offer good product, good service, and you're honest, uh, and you keep your promise, um, you will win. Great. Yeah. Sherry? Sorry. I actually really wanted to, to hear you tell the audience what you, what you were telling me earlier, you know, if you don't feel too, uh, that part. I, yeah. yeah. You want me to tee that yeah, up? You want, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> if you say that one part. Of, one of, the, one of the, uh, <laughs> the questions we were talking about was, um, in the readings, and so speaking with uh, a representative of Google Brain, but not on behalf of just Google, but in the artificial intelligence world, and as we think about machine intelligence, I think many of us are reading that um, we have inherent biases in the way we're structured now, and are we concerned or is it real to be concerned that those biases would essentially get programmed into the AI engines that are now being, essentially these are the kernels in the nucleus for what will be a, a very large system and infrastructure over the next years and decades. And is that something to be concerned about, yes or no, and or what do we need to do? Sherry has the answer. Oh. <laughs> so first of all, <laughs> this is all my own opinion. This is not yeah, represent yeah. opinions of all Google, the obviously. All the but I, I really liked uh, what you said earlier. You said um, if we don't filter, we would naturally get diversity. And I think that is so true. So let me actually answer your first question. Yeah. Do, do we believe that the programmer's bias, the developer's bias can be put into whatever that we're developing? Uh, yes, I, I, I believe the answer is yes. And uh, second, the follow-up question is that how do you overcome that? Just like you said, if you don't filter, you naturally get diversity. And one example I can give you is that I work with about 300 researchers uh, in Google Brain. We have people from 48 countries. We have we have people of every, every background, like just the researchers. They, they, we have neuroscientists, mathematicians, physicists, musicians, any background that you can think of. So because we don't filter it, all these people, they came in, when, like I interviewed many of them, right? You know, the question that I would ask is that what would you want to do in this group? What do you think machine learning can do for you? What do you think you can do for machine learning? What are you here? What would you like to achieve? And I always look for the answer. They all have wonderful stories to tell. And with that in mind, if we don't filter, we naturally get all this really diverse background. And as a result, the product that we develop is, in my opinion, <laughs> really diverse and really reflect all these experiences, their beliefs, their thinking, their philosophy, every single thing that they carry forth with them. And I think that's absolutely critical. And very early on when we developed this wonderful, I don't know if any of you get a chance to play with it, it's this auto-captioning uh, AI program that we put out there, which is that uh, you can take a picture, you upload it to Google, you will give it a, a caption automatically. But very often, you know, you, you, you'll be like, it's a pizza, it's a cup, it's a glass, it's a man. But whenever, that we, whenever we cannot tell, it would say, it's man talking on a cell phone. <laughs> 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 because, <laughs> That's our default answer. Um, so at this point, we're obviously, we're pushing the envelopes. We're trying to teach machines to learn. them. I'm sure I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But just like with children, right, just like with any learning, if you have never been exposed to it, you wouldn't know what it is. 
And in this case, it's just for fun, we gave it the default answer, which is man talking on the cell phone. So like, you can take a random picture of a watermelon on the pole, we'd be like man talking on a cell phone. <laughs> but, so to coming, coming back to, to your answer, definitely, I think the diversity, our, our background, our experience, every single, single person's thinking, their philosophy does influence what the product that you develop, which is, once again, yeah. why it's absolutely, in my opinion, critical to have diversity. And how to achieve that, I think that's a, probably your next bigger, answer. Yeah. <laughs> how to better achieve question. that. question. And yeah, so I think, and maybe I'll, I didn't, I didn't share part of the story. So my first startup uh, was a software company, and we were developing uh, advanced algorithms at the time. So it's 1996, 97 time period. Back then, we actually didn't have anything called broadband communication. And uh, so it's a whole different world um, than what we're living in right now. And these were algorithms that actually were enabled by the technology that was developed in the late 70s and early 80s called, you know, things that, for those of you who remember the history, the Star Wars initiative when they were trying to, like, move missiles and things all around the world and use adaptive control and intelligence. And you needed supercomputers. There was an advent of something called a digital signal processor and a DSP that allowed us to be able to do it in a small footprint. So I, I had these, you know, my co-founder was this incredible, uh, brilliant person uh, out of Stanford. Um, happened to be out of Stanford, but I was from Northeastern. Um, and uh, we were developing solutions and algorithms in a pretty sophisticated, heady, mathematic algorithm development space for the time. And I, the company in its first phase, first few years, about 20 or 30 people, um, all of them, you know, I was the least educated person on the team um, because they all had at least one, if not two, PhDs in advanced development and the work that they had done. And uh, I had a media person come to interview me because I hadn't realized it because I was too busy running a startup, but I had an incredible amount of diversity. Um, I had a 60-40 female-male uh, population. I had diversity in terms of ethnicity. Uh, I had age diversity. I had sort of this super brilliant person who at the time was sort of graduated you know, out of college when they were 16 and sort of a, a brilliant genius. I had people that were you know, in, in later parts of their career but just really strong. And they had presumed as a female CEO that I had architected the diversity. Um, and I explained to them that it, as a you know, starving entrepreneur, venture capital-backed company, I didn't have time to you know, architect those type of things, but I had a sort on excellence. And I've now watched over the last almost 30 years in the different companies I've helped create, build, or been able to be part of, and what I've noticed is, is sort of to your point about the diversity, if you sort on excellence and you actually remove the filter or the lens of whatever bias or structure, and again, it's not necessarily just gender of men versus women, it's all sorts of filters that we inadvertently put on ourselves because of, you know, there's a collegiality that we get when we work together with known things. And working with people of different experiences, different languages, different cultures, is actually more work. Um, but I found that in my experience, if you don't, if you sort on excellence and, and not as an official advertisement, but I mean, some people might say that the rigorous but very inclusive way Google recruits some of their technical talent, I think qualifies for sort on excellence in certain categories, and I think many companies do that. Um, maybe not all, but many do. When you do that, there's a natural, if you don't allow the biases to come in, there is a natural diversity, because I suspect, even though I'm not a biologist, that if we go back, so, you know, nature allows natural diversity to happen and survival of the fittest. And that diversity and natural diversity is almost what I think we need to get back to. So as we think about robotics and machine learning and artificial intelligence, and we somehow find a way, I think, to remove those filters and get back to almost a natural selection process, I actually think we won't have to work as hard on forcing um, the inclusion and, and, and fighting diversity issues that we have today because, and the good news for us as uh, technologists, engineers, and scientists is, as you said, we just need to be good at what we do. Um, there's actually a good likelihood, I think, that if you just sort on excellence, you're probably gonna end up with a majority of women 
Um, but that's just that's just thirty years of experience talking. So I don't, you know, I I, I haven't done um, enough data analytics on that. But that's my own personal experience. But um, and as before, I sort of throw. I want to get some last comments on that reflection from both of you. I also want to say that I'm going to open it up for questions, but also I'm going to open it up for anyone who wants to share a story or sort of make a comment on what we've been talking about and share that so you don't, you don't need to ask us a question, but we'd really like to have a few minutes and have some people make some comments, um, positive or negative, or sort of share a thought process. So be thinking about that for a few minutes. So April, So to comments? add your uh, um, diversity, I really agree that um, uh, yeah, natural selection is good. Uh, and then, so natural, uh, basically in the world, men and women are the same, almost the same number, a little bit more women, I think, yeah. Uh, but almost the same, 50 to 50. Uh, and then I realized that when I go through the interview process, it goes through selecting, um, what's my criteria selecting my team, is that I like to keep it uh, uh, numbered even. Uh, like 50 percent of 50 uh, percent of my coworkers are men, and 50 percent uh, coworkers are are female, um, and I think that's the most the most uh, ultimate um, uh, optimal way uh, to get things done. I realize um, because if you pair, if you uh, you trying to get done a project, I I test it different ways. You pair like two two men or three men so together trying to, as a team, to finish the project. Efficiency somehow dropped compared to men and women, team together, the efficiency, boom, goes up. So I realized that, I mean, basically, I think there is a, there is a dynamic between men and a dynamic between women, but if you, you pair them together, and actually it's the most efficient way to get job done. Uh, that's basically our company's culture. Like, Get job done. Get things done. Great. <laughs> yeah. Do we have a neuroscientist psychologist in the room that can comment on that fact? Because I'm super <laughs> curious. I'm yeah. really curious about that. I'm sure it's, it's a psychologically yeah. interesting. related. That's interesting. Yes. Yeah. So now in my company, there we're even numbered. I, I do have a, a really related comment that I've spoken to with before. Um, Thanks, Sarah. Sorry. I, I give talks too, so I'm going to stand here. Sure. Um, so I, I maybe uh, introduce yourself. Sorry. Hi, I'm Aaron Rapaki. Um, I graduated Northeastern uh, Industrial Engineering degree, minor mechanical. Um, I graduated in '07, then I got my master's in mechanical at UMass Lowell, um, and worked in a robotics lab at UMass Lowell. So I was living in the computer science department, building them robots. Um, but it was the Northeastern Co-op program. Um, had internships at iRobot and. Basically, I was 16 years old. When I was 16, I decided I wanted to run robot startups. So went to Northeastern, went to UMass Lowell, then moved here in 2009. And I've worked here at um, six different robotic star startups. So about um, women in the workforce and stress. One of the, hobbies I, I, one of the hobbies I pursued during college was actually hang gliding. So oh. I, was going to, I was a student at Northeastern, but I would drive up to New Hampshire to go jump off Whoa. mountains in New Hampshire. Wow. And there was a women's <laughs> hang gliding event where they had a discussion about women in hang gliding. And I found a lot of parallels between engineering, because for my capstone project at Northeastern, I asked the director of research at iRobot for $10,000 to do that. I wanted to go build iRobot a robot, and I'm like, oh, stomach wrench, you know, pain. Um, psychologically, it's all about um, how men and women deal with stress hormones. Mm -hmm. So on the cliff, all the guys, would be like, okay, I'm not sure about the weather. It looks scary. I'm gonna go do it. <laughs> and they, they, they a slightly, slightly less thought. <laughs> um, a little more like just go do the thing. And um, there, that's a valid stress response when you want to get things done. But all the women would hang back and like talk about the weather. Like, is it actually <laughs> safe? I kind of see the storm front coming through. There's going to be a gust front in like 20 minutes. Am I going to die? Am I going to die if I jump off this thing? And, and what I realized in that moment is, as women, our stress response is a little more reflective. We're going to look at the situation a little bit more, but that could be perceived by the men as indecision or a lack of confidence. So I learned that by mixing up a lot of different hobbies when I was in college. And, and I realized, um, that you know, both structures are valued, 
But I'll just say in my experience being in startups mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley and San Francisco, and what I tell reporters, because I speak about robotic, um, robotics and women mm -hmm. and technology to reporters, um, I personally, I don't feel like I'm at any disadvantage. I, I'm fortunate to work with great guys. Most of my clients are guys in their 40s and 50s. Um, I'll go banter with them at a conference, and it's not weird. I'm just talking about what industrial automation problems they want to solve. And it's really about knowledge. And I'd say, I think what also people are looking for is passion. Like when you're passionate about what you're studying and what you're doing and what you want to learn about, people are willing to share with you if you're curious about something. Um, so you don't have to go in being the smartest person in the room. Just be curious, be open-minded. And I've had no issues. Um, like, and I've Great. seen the difference between by being a woman. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Erin. Cool. Thanks. Yay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Great so I'll, I'll at least comment is now someone who sits on, on boards that that comment and observation about the way men and women deal with risk um, kind of helps explain the statistic that seems to be growing that boards that have a balance of women on them are outperforming financially in part because I think it's a natural risk management. It's a balance, and I'd advocate it's another version of the natural selection process. So it's not that we want to promote one or the other, but again, if we sort on excellence and try to find the right balance um, and remove the filters or the inadvertent biases, we get there. Um, so maybe now, since thank you, Aaron, for kicking it off, before Sherry, I just let you do any final comments, and I'm going to open it up for Q&A. Okay. okay. No, I don't have to. Any but now I know why 50-50 works. <laughs> <laughs> it really works. Try it out. Yeah, all right. <laughs> anyone else have any questions uh, for the panelists or anyone, any other stories to share or comments that you like? No one? No stories? OK. Um, how are we doing on time? That's good? OK, so a, cu a couple other things. Um, I want to thank, thank you for sort of the time in sort of the structured format. Uh, we're going to have a few moments after and have a reception. But first of all, I want to take a moment and talk about the Women Who Empower campaign. Um, and you know, to, if you're not aware of the program, if you haven't attended and participated before, um, the program funds events like this. But it also funds specific um, scholarships and or support of women who are working in particular areas who might want to be able to afford to go to a conference or a symposium to expand their knowledge and their learning that helps them both in their technical and or their leadership positions and roles. I'd encourage you to take a look at, and get more information. Um, I want to thank those who have already given. Uh, there is a, a table over here that if you'd like to make a gift and a donation of any size or a contribution, it'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, we'd like to continue the ability to, to have forums like this and also to highlight and enable uh, individual women who have certain things that they'd like to accomplish in assignments and work. We'd like to be able to help jumpstart them. You were able to get iRobot to help co-fund and do some work. Um, I think there's a chance here for us to think differently and think out of the box and be able to do that. Uh, so I encourage you to take a look at that or ask any of the Northeastern uh, team about it. I uh, would be happy to tell you more about it. I think it's something that's very unique and very powerful um, that can impact either yourself or people that you're working with as well. So I would like to thank my panelists in terms of the conversation. Thank you for Aaron for your input and uh, would now welcome us to uh, spend some time together. We're going to open up the reception and thank you very much for tonight. Thank you. Thank you.